Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. Well, if you are not living under a rock, you may know <laughs> that it is the one-year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection or whatever you want to call what happened I, on that day. I know it's very controversial, the labeling of it. So we have our own breaking points look at what led us to that, mm -hmm. what has changed, if anything, going forward, how the media has handled it, and also some numbers today that I think are really relevant to the conversation. We just got new jobs numbers that show pretty good job creation, also show mass resignations continuing at yes. historic levels. So everything very much in flux there. Um, also some additional news with regards to Omicron and some very disturbing decision making that is happening out there in the world. And this may be my own personal bias, but having uh, suffered in some very small ways during snowstorm in Virginia, we're going to take a look at the horrendous treatment of all of those people who were trapped on 95 for more than a day. The governor is now basically blaming them. Yeah, he's blaming the drivers. Completely yeah. shirking yeah. any sort of responsibility for what was an absolutely dehumanizing, dangerous situation. So I have to give you those details here. Also, we have Glenn Greenwald on to help us understand what some of the more dangerous implications of the way that 1-6 could be weaponized to further strengthen the deep state. Always great to talk to Glenn. Um, and we did want to start with some of our reflections yes. on January 6th. And basically what we wanted to talk about here at the top is, has anything changed? The metrics, the underlying metrics that led us to a day that both of us considered to be terrible. This was a horrible There's day for no the country. Defense. And obviously the individuals who were involved had agency in what they decided to do and the crimes that they decided to commit. And the president was the most proximate cause mm -hmm. of the events of that day. But in addition, there are a lot of underlying social factors, the types of things that we talk about here on this show all the time, that contributed to creating such a horrendous, inflammatory situation that people under false pretenses would think that they were acting patriotically to storm into the Capitol and try to subvert an election. I mean, that's, that's the reality. So where are we now as compared to a year ago? And we have to say on most of the metrics, things have actually gotten worse. Yeah, way worse. So the core rot that has led, I think everyone would agree, us to such a dangerous place as the country has in many ways gotten worse. So the first thing we wanted to put up here um, to demonstrate that fact is there's a new poll. This is from the Washington Post and University of Maryland. One in three Americans say violence against government can be justified, um, citing a variety of, you know, corruption was one of the things, authoritarianism, mm -hmm. fascism, all sorts of different reasons why people across the spectrum are saying, hey, in certain circumstances, violence might be justified. These numbers are the worst, the largest numbers ever recorded on this metric. When you dig into it, um, it's pretty revealing what people are saying. There was a quote from a, a woman, a, a mother, 32 years old, who's a Republican. She says, the world we live in now is scary. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but sometimes it feels like a movie. It's no longer a war against Democrats and Republicans. It's a war between good and evil. And when you get into that type of binary good versus evil language. Not good. Yeah, that ends up justifying a lot of things ca that can lead to catastrophic and horrible consequences. There was, you know, th there was a rise in the numbers across partisan lines. Um, independents actually had the highest numbers on this metric. 41% right. of independents said violence against government can sometimes be justified. 23% of Dems and 40% of the Republican Party. I want to say I feel a little bit complicated about this one, Sagar, because— mm. I mean, the nation was founded in violence. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have truly a tyrannical, oppressive, authoritarian government, then in some circumstances, violence can be justified. However, we are nowhere near that place, I hope. And the fact that you have so many more Americans feeling like, well, we might be getting there is a very, very worrying sign. And this sort of binary of good versus evil narrative that has taken hold in corners across the political spectrum is a really dangerous place for the country to be. It's a, just a complete lack of faith in all of our institutions. And at this point, anybody who defends the institutions, in my opinion, is kind of an idiot. I mean, I was thinking about it yeah. today. There was some discourse online talking about whether school closures amount to as bad of a situation as the war in Iraq. 
I think that's oh a little God. bit <laughs> of a overstretch. But I was trying to think about it. And I was like, well, okay, well, where is this person coming from? Like, what exactly is it? Which is that you have an institutional state and a media which push a line, which becomes completely, obviously a terrible decision, yeah. which continues to be perpetuated. And then two years later, a very, very small group is allowed to criticize it a little bit. And it gets to the point where it becomes self-sustaining such that now the president of the United States, the leader of the Democratic Party, Joe Biden, says, I don't think school closures are a good idea. And right now, today, one third of the children in the state of New Jersey are not in school. Okay, that's that's like hundreds of thousands of kids. So when you start to think about it that way, I think, hmm, you know what? That's not a terrible point. The point is, is that we have government which makes terrible decisions. Consistently, we try to have democratic elections of change. Every single election since yeah. two, barring 2004, which was just such an anomaly because of 9-11, we have had a desperate want of change. And every single time, we've been denied that over and over again from institutional corruption. And that is what led to the fact that these people, mostly boomers, had so much faith in a guy in a shark charlatan like Donald Trump. I mean, we have a graph here, which you put on the screen, please, which is Republican loyalty to Trump post-January 6th. Check this out. Trump, his general loyalty remained above 75% the entire time, po like pre and post. His post-suffering was like marginal at best. But look at Mike Pence and especially Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell Trump. <laughs> from 50 in terms of his loyalty to in the minus 35 range. The reason I think about that is that the people who are in charge of Republican institutions do not represent Republican voters. Many Democratic leaders do not, Nancy Pelosi does not represent the mean Democratic uh, voter. When you have that type of situation, what are people supposed to feel? That's they it. turn to Trump and he tells them to storm the Capitol and they do so. I know they have agency, but I will always think about that ProPublica piece that was published right afterwards, where it was this guy, he lived in Alabama, he was part of a union, he lost his job, post-financial crisis, and he went kind of nuts, and he started to believe it. He voted for Obama in Alabama, a union member, and then ended up going all in on Trump. He died on January 6th from, I shouldn't be laughing, from a heart attack, because it was like one of the most exciting days of his lives. But that's something that you have to think about. And you know, they're all citizens, they get votes too. I'm not saying what they did was a good thing, but you gotta try and understand, why did this happen? How, well, you that's explain thing. that number. Look at the number, explain it to me. The only way is, through the polls, thinking back through institutional failure, 2008, guy loses his job, union. I mean, there's no other explanation. Well, and here's the thing, is when you feel like legitimate avenues, like the official channels of political change have effectively been shut off. Yeah, that's right. That's when these sorts of very troubling metrics start to rise because people think, well, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. And so that total lack of faith in institution, that total lack of belief that anything you do at the ballot box is gonna make a lick of difference, that's how you end up in a place like this um, I've actually been, um, uh, Kyle and I are interviewing Jordan Peterson next week, so oh, I've been reading a lot of Jordan Peterson lately. Yeah. There's one thing that he said, he's not my favorite on everything, but there was one thing that he said that I thought was really interesting, which is that when you don't have this sort of like value system in place, people either fall into nihilism or they get, you know, subsumed by an ideology and can be preyed upon, this is a little bit of my take on it, not exactly his, but can be preyed upon by people like Trump, by mm -hmm. these sort of like charismatic leaders where you become so, in, you're so desperate for some kind of value system that makes sense, it makes you vulnerable to, you know, whatever charismatic figure happens to come along. And so on that metric, things have certainly not gotten better. And there's, you know, a lot more core raw, just evidence of the, you know, symptoms of decline and despair in this country. We can throw the next one up on the screen, which is that, you know, an in increasing number of Americans say they're actually worse off financially this year than last year. Somewhat worse off or much worse off. The largest share since the pandemic when we were in total free fall. Yeah. Okay, so... You know, I mean, this makes sense, too. You had some relief checks that went out. You had unemployment. You had some programs that were helping bolster people, helping, you know, keep some money in their savings accounts, keep them going, bills paid. All of that has been spent down 
over the past year, and all of those programs and supports have been pulled, at the same time you have inflation. Yeah, you have wages going up, but you have inflation eating into that and then plus some. So if finances, which, I mean, if you look throughout history, economics contributes to a lot of social turmoil, to the extent that's a factor here, which I think it is, things are getting worse. You also have on metrics, you know, of despair, overdoses reaching new heights over the past year and over the past couple of years. Let's throw this next tear sheet up there on the screen. More than a million, more than a million Americans have died from overdoses during the opioid epidemic. So that's from 99 till today. We've also tracked how for some demographics, um, overdose deaths are now the leading mm -hmm. cause of death. The number spiked significantly during the pandemic. You know, we'll be learning over the coming months what that looked like in the year that just ended. Inequality accelerated by the pandemic. Let's put the next one there up on the screen. The share of wealth held by a 10% of the world's richest hit historic levels amid the pandemic. So part of what was going on is, yeah, I mean, listen, the, the oligarchs of the nation and of the world, they're always in position to profit off of crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single time, whether it's war or climate change or a pandemic, they're the ones who are in position to profit off of that. And then you had the response for the stock market was, you know, trillions of dollars to prop up what ends up being the top percentage points, mostly, of Americans. And while there was support that was pretty effective, ultimately, that was given to regular people, I mean, it came nowhere close to what was being pumped out by the Fed, which, again, widens inequality. And, you know, outside of it being a measure of fairness, when you have this system that is so dramatically unbalanced, that also contributes to social instability because you lose that sense that this is just or fair at all. And when you lose that buy-in in society, I mean, again, history is littered with examples of revolutions that are sparked and pitchforks that come when that situation is exacerbated. So yet another trend that was accelerated by the pandemic, making things even worse than they were at this time yeah. last year in and a lot of senses. Something Andrew Yang said during his campaign, which always resonated with me, is that there's only one, there's like the most stark metric is are people living or dying? And well, we have the data now for 2021. Let's put it up there on the screen. The US population growth has stalled to the lowest record, uh, lowest rate on record thanks to the pandemic, even slower than during the Great Depression. Now, you may think that this is because of increased pandemic deaths, but it's actually not. It's because of lower birth rates, um, lower rates of migration, and yes, an increase in mortality, but the all-cause mortality there, COVID is only a part of it given that it was disproportionately amongst the elderly. We just pointed out record amounts of deaths, 18 to 45, from fentanyl, which is now the leading cause of death amongst that demographic. One million Americans died from opioids. And if you look at it regionally, it's actually even worse. So if the 2010 to 2020, 50% of the counties in the United States lost population, 50%. We are increasingly getting divided by education, class, and the people who are lower middle class and working class who are moving out are generally living in the burb areas, commuting in in order to serve the most wealthy as they yeah. continue to get richer and richer. Think like Uber Eats drivers, that type of thing. The service economy of the rich is actually one of the gro most growing sectors. I remember once some neoliberals were cheering the fact that the most highest growing uh, types of jobs are like personal trainers, uh, nail technicians, uh, and something else. I think delivery drivers was another one. And once I was like, look, there's nothing, there's zero nothing wrong with those professions whatsoever. But like all of those are just basically trickle down effects of like people who are really rich yeah. who can afford to outsource, you know, beautician, aesthetics, right. all well, that type of thing to others. I mean, unless you're one of these right. like superstar soul cycle type personal trainers, yeah. it's I'm sure very yeah, difficult. Yeah, also you probably don't make that much money. Yeah, right? you're, you know, you're don't certainly don't have a union. Mm. You probably don't have benefits. And many of these jobs, you're, you know. You actually don't. I've talked to some of them. You're yeah. basically a gig worker, an independent contractor with no protection from the labor market. Yeah, that is what our economy is spinning out as these very precarious, low-wage, low-benefit type of jobs. We do have a little bit. I mean, we're going to talk about the Great Resignation. So there are some hopeful things. I don't want to be all 
gloom and doom here. But we have to take stock as, you know, we enter 2022 here and a year out from 1-6. The easy thing is to look at, you know, the individuals who are specifically involved. And listen, there are millions and millions of people in the country who have suffered who did not storm the Capitol. So again, there is personal agency involved here, both in people's choices that day and also their own choices to allow themselves to get sucked into these sort of conspiracy theories that led them to take that action that day and really think they were like doing the right thing as patriots. Um, the other easy thing is just to, you know, say, oh, well, it's just the Republican Party and Donald Trump that is bad. All of that is fine and true, but it doesn't solve the problem to just say, oh, well, you know, this percentage of the country is bad, and so what can, can we do about it? I can already hear the naysayers, economic anxiety, you know, disproven again. Okay, look, I mean, you have, it's a general social pathology that you understand in every other society except America for some Yeah, that's reason. right. You know, it's like, you can look at Egypt and be like, well, high youth unemployment, you know, this, this, and this leads to the conditions of a revolution. Right. Well, you've got a youth bulge here in this country, Greece or whatever, Spain um, is another one. But then, you know, you can't turn a real honest eye to your own country. It's the same thing. That's exactly what's happening here. And I think about it kind of like a statistical distribution, which is that if the statistical distribution is going to be high of the amount of wealth inequality and the, you know, the normal distribution, so to speak, yeah, most people are going to be like generally miserable. But what is part of that? Which is that on the tail ends, you have the extremities. And what you want to do is move the distribution over so that the extremity becomes smaller and smaller. And unfortunately, we continue to slide towards a point where the median point for most Americans is that they are underpaid, they're blown tire away from bankruptcy, they feel as if the next year is gonna be worse than this year. And you know, we didn't even mention COVID policy restriction and anxiety, gas prices, yeah. all of that feeding in. It's not a good time to be an American right now. That has downstream effects in our democracy and has outsized effects in the extreme events that you're gonna see in terms of politics. So yeah. if you wanna know why democracy is in crisis, if it even is, this is why. But would, you're not going to hear any of this on the news. Yeah, I, w I would say that it definitely is. Yeah. I mean, when you see this level of number of people who are, you know, contemplating the, the possible, what could possibly lead them to justifying violence against the government, when you have such low trust in institutions, um, when you have so many people, uh, first, I mean, listen, let's be honest, too. Democrats questioned the legitimacy of Trump's election oh, God, and yeah, spun up a like whole fantasy ago. about yeah. Russiagate to justify why they lost an election that a lot of, you know, a lot of the country believed and continues to believe, by the way. And then you have Republicans who just invented the most insane shit you've ever heard mm -hmm. to imagine that their side didn't lose. When you get into this, nobody is believing in, you know, the, the, the sanctity of the election. They're not buying into the results. Yeah, I would say democracy is in trouble. The last thing that I'll, I'll throw in here, and I was thinking about it because we were both, I think, listening to Joe Rogan with yes. Oliver Stone yesterday. Yeah, that's right. And I think he makes a good point about how JFK's assassination, and look, personally, I think it was a cover-up and the CIA was involved, but whatever you think about that, the fact that there was very clearly an effort to control the information that was coming out. The fact that you still have such a high percentage of Americans who do not believe the official narrative on such a seminal event in American history, that also serves as a kind of a, a spark of a long-term rot. And when you see, certainly on that metric as well, the continued power of the military-industrial complex, the continued power of the deep state, that's another thing that really makes people cynical about their own government, makes people suspicious of their own government, makes people not trust their own government, and oftentimes for very good reasons. So I think that's also a sort of factor you have to throw in here is the lack of transparency and the nefarious doings of our government. You can look to Julian Assange and the war crimes that were revealed in the Bush era. All of these things contribute to a place where people just do not trust the official narrative any longer. Yeah, you see the people in the media being like, why doesn't anybody trust the government? It's like, well, uh, there was, let's start, you know, okay, JFK's assassination, that was crazy. Then Vietnam, that was pretty crazy. Yeah. Then, uh, what, Watergate? Yeah. That was and all pretty that nuts. Too. Yeah, uh, Watergate was pretty nuts. Then the church committee, and you're like, oh my God, like, I can't believe all this stuff was happening, and now here's all of the stuff where it gets outright admitted. Then the 80s were like, okay, you know, <laughs> once or two, there was like recession and all that stuff. The 90s were probably the There's best a lot time. Of cold, wa cold um, war. 
Right, the funny cold, business. Cold War we'll finally ended, and then you know the dot com stuff was pretty fun, and then boom, the you know the crash of two thousand. Bush gets elected, two thousand and one, and then that's it. We're totally off to the races. So you have the inter- interregnum period of like the Watergate, where you really destroyed what once people used to think when the president spoke, it was the truth. I mean, this was a, a thing under Kennedy and Eisenhower, which you cannot even fathom today. But when you read about it, the level of trust between the American government and the president post World. War II is unbelievable. And, you know, under Johnson, the term credibility gap gets coined. And Mm -hmm. from that point onward, distrust in the government becomes a mainstream thought of American society. It never existed, um, or at least, you know, since like the Civil War times. That's not something you can just get back. And then you have Iraq and the financial crisis. People my age are like, forget it. You know, my default assumption when they say something, especially on COVID, is I don't believe you. You know, prove it to me. Uh, I have to, or I have to uh, go and see it with my own eyes for me to be like, okay, this is a real thing. That's not a healthy way. Uh, But once again, you know, you ask questions, why is democracy in crisis? This is why. Yeah. That's the only reason. Hey, guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.